until I've been. So yeah, uh, Alhamdulillah, if you can get some more people uh, to sort of yeah, come through, and just to, uh, I mean, yeah, just a yeah, quick, uh, obviously, um, yeah, point as well that uh, we've got yeah quite a few. Um, We've got quite a few uh, yeah, sisters and your brothers who uh, are yeah, tuned in, uh, alhamdulillah. And we've got yeah, quite a few yeah, mobile phones and also um, yeah, odd yeah, numbers in there as well. <laughs> so if you can just um, yeah, change that, if we, if we are a Galaxy phone or if we are an S20 yeah, or we are a bunch of numbers, yeah, please can you actually yeah, change that to uh, your name? And then yeah, that way we can have a more tailored approach uh, to yourselves, inshallah. So we're just uh, yeah, waiting for everything to be uh, yeah, set up. And when that is, then we'll uh, yeah, go ahead with uh, Ustad Ghais, uh, Ustad Imam Ghais's uh, yeah, lecture, inshallah. But in the meanwhile, uh, if we can have uh, yeah, some more yeah, feedback. So for those people who have just attended now, uh, my main question is, is that what are your takeaways? That this is only going to be a two, three days uh, yeah, retreat. That in the last year, day and a hind blowing, I have shed tears uh, from my heart uh, uh, and my heart tremors, I need to spend more time on these retreats to fully understand. SubhanAllah. Uh, again, um, inferring uh, obviously from the sister that she's, uh, she's really had Personality. They're the one who, this is such a personality that me and you can fit. What I mean by that, me and you can fit, is that despite whatever time, whatever age, 
wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever status that you are, whether you're poor or you're rich, or whether you're a fakir or you're ghani, or whether you're a learned person or a layman, whether you are handsome or you're ugly, or whether you are pretty or you're actually dastardly unwell, if you're healthy or unhealthy, it doesn't matter who you are, what you are, whichever corner of the planet you're in, this blessed personality opened the doors for me and you to achieve in the affairs of Rasulullah He, through his life, has shown us how a person can actually, despite not meeting physically the beloved messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how a person, a person can connect, how a person can be enlightened and a person can receive the presence and gifts and fruits and fairs and blessings, unlimited fairs and blessings of Rasulullah without not meeting them physically. And this person who I'm talking about is none other than Sayyidina Awais Al-Qarni radiallahu anhu, who was from Yemen, uh, from uh, a, a tribe from Murad, and village called Qarn. That's why he knows Al-Qarni. So he was an individual, a personality, like I said, who opened the doors for me and you. Let's have a look as to how he did this. What was his life? How did he live his life? So that me and you can take benefit from it. Uh, as, as here, as you can see that his blessed full name is Sayyiduna Awais Ibn Amir Ibn Juz Ibn Malik al qarn Qarni al Muradi al Yemeni, Radi al Anhu. And no, he was not, you might be saying, but the case, why using Radi al Anhu is usually, usually assigned to the Sahaba. No, this is not uh, correct. Yes, generally the, the ulama, the Fuqahas, have maybe put this down that, but literally Radi al Anhu means, so I may mean, Allah so be pleased with them. And you can use it for anyone. Yes, generally they say use it with the Sahaba and Rahimullah use it with. Uh, with the pious and awliya and salihin, but there is no haraj, there is no harm in using it uh, for these men because Allah SWT is pleased, is and was pleased with Sayyidina Awais al Qarni, will be pleased, and uh, on the akhirah, he'll also be pleased with him. So he's pleased with him, and uh, he, uh, Allah SWT is pleased with Sayyidina Awais al Qarni, and he's pleased with Allah SWT as well in, the, uh, in all aspects, in all manner. He was born in a village called Karan, and this is obviously you know, where he stayed all his life long time, really, apart from when he then helped Sayyidina Ali Ratala and where he then martyred and was buried, uh, became martyred in the Battle of Sifin, and he was buried in uh, Raqqa in Syria. That is where he's actually Mazar and his grave is actually uh, there. So at a year, early young age, as it is, his father died at a young age, and so is, he has some similitude, as you can see. To the Rasulullah so obviously he was an orphan from young age, Rasulullah was an orphan from offset. And what he had to do was he had to look after his blessed mother, uh, and who was old, frail, and in the latter stages he stayed to become blind as well. So he had to look after her, and it is this uh, looking after which is the thing which you all need to understand as to the sacrifice that Sayyidina Awais al did. So he spent his time taking care of his mother. He earned his livelihood taking care of camels. Whatever he earned, he'd actually spend that and then spend it on his mother. And if he also had leprosy and whatever leftover that they had, he would actually then give that away in charity and sadaqah. And because of his leprosy, when Allah eventually he prayed to Allah SWT, made God to Allah SWT, eventually Allah SWT cured him, apart from leaving a mark, a coin side piece, uh, skin on his shoulder. And the strange thing is that that mark, that bit, he would look at it and he would thank Allah SWT, that um, be grateful to Allah SWT, despite his disfigured, but for the favors that Allah SWT bestowed of him, that everything else, Alhamdulillah, is fine and healthy. It's just this, but he's still happy that Allah SWT cured him and is able to actually carry out his normal task. He continued to look after his mother, who's becoming more dependent on her. And then it is because of the fact that he kept on, uh, what happened was a delegation ambassadors when Islam was spreading came to uh, Yemen, uh, Yemen. And it is through 
in fact that Sayyidina Uwais al an it is mentioned that one day he was reading uh, he was reading uh, and he was trying to look for something in the dark and he had to get his they were very destitute they were very poor but he was looking for something in the dark and he couldn't see anything yet he asked his mum to find uh, the thing in the in the darkness and when these ambassadors they came and read a verse of the Quran in which it said is that if you and for whom uh, God has not appointed light there will be no light and it is when he went to the ambassador and he heard and uh, heard this verse of the Quran he automatically thought look this is relating to what happened to me the other night uh, I will be in such darkness if I don't embrace Islam and this is how my life is I have to embrace that and there and then he embraced and then uh, Alhamdulillah that is a, a, a part of history that really because then he became such uh, elevated uh, person that after all the companions he is the highest of the tabi'een one of the highest ranking of the tabi'een so Sayyidina Awais al an had an issue because of the fact now you really have to understand this point is that you have to put yourself in this position the dilemma for Sayyidina Awais al an was that on one side he is alive he is well, he has brought faith upon Rasulullah and brought iman upon Prophet. But the hukum of the Prophet, the hukum of Sharia, is that to look after the mother. So, one is that look after the mother, and the other is Prophet. You can go, you can visit, and what happens is that you're not just going to be an ordinary person, you'll become a Sahabi. Just think, think for a while what is uh, what does it mean that me and you now physically imagine. Let's just uh, hypothetically imagine is that the Prophet now physically is here. I'm just trying to get so that you understand is that physically is uh, here, present, and you have an option to go and visit him. Now, if I just to, so that uh, to know that you all understanding is that there's no right or wrong answer. I'm just saying is that imagine. Let's just reduce it down. Let's say, for example, I'm going to uh, put it down to something uh, less uh, status. Let's say, for example, if you had the option to visit, I'll just say, say the Nagos Park, say the Abdul Qadir Jilani, I'm just saying. Let's say he's physically alive now, say the Abdul Qadir Jilani, Rahmullah. And what's happening is that he's, let's say, he's in Manchester. Uh, and he's in Manchester. And you have the option. To visit him, or the other thing is to actually looking after your mom or looking after your children. Now, what would you do? Let's see if, if you imagine that you have Sayyidina Abdul Qajulani, Rahmullah. I'm just saying hypothetically, just to imagine you have Sayyidina Qajulani, or let's say Imabu Hanifa, Rahmullah. He is physically alive and he's, he's, he's actually there in Manchester. You have the option to either go and see him, learn from him, ask him something, or you stay home and uh, you, you have to make sure that you look to you look after your parents or you look after your children. Which option would you choose? So is uh, are the participants understanding my question? Which option do you, there is no right or wrong answer, doesn't matter. I want to see, okay, so imagine saying, so then goes back, uh, what, another sister is saying my parents, what would you choose? With the Brez, uh, you choose Manchester, mashallah. I know you live in London, but uh, I, you like Manchester, mashallah. So some of you are saying uh, Manchester, uh, so I would go meet him. So you're, if we skip, from this we can see, there is, uh, with, from this we can see that there is a 50-50 divide. It seems like a 50, some would go and some wouldn't. And again, this is telling you is that, okay, I have the option. Some would love uh, to go and visit and some would say, no, I'll just stay home, look after my parents. The thing is that now let's equate this to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm just saying for hypothetically for, for you to understand is that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is present. He's a, 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 I'm just saying for, for you to understand, I'm, uh, 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 Allah Sallallahu forgive me if there's no uh, be or disrespect is that I'm just saying for you to understand, imagine now Rasulullah is present and uh, it is said that they are there. You got the option now, who would go and visit? 
which would you choose? Now, nearly all of you are going to say, visit the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because that is what love demands. Love dictates that I am the Ummah to the Prophet ﷺ. And you've only got that one moment and you've got that one chance because it's just for, uh, let's say, for example, it's for a day or so, you can actually be. that. Uh, let's say, I'm just saying, uh, I can do anything, but I'm just saying that for one day, you can be with the Prophet ﷺ for one day. And, and it's all the way in Manchester. Now love will say, everybody will say, everybody will try and flock and they will go running towards the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because if you are now, love is demanding, you should go and visit because we're the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. To see the Prophet ﷺ, to believe upon him, to follow him, to love him, to even to catch a glance is the best thing that any of all the trees, of all the heavenly tree that there is, there is nothing better than this to have a glimpse of the blessed uh, feature of the Prophet ﷺ, to hear the blessed talk of the, uh, the speech of the Prophet ﷺ, to feel, smell the fragrance, the aroma that is coming from the blessed body of the Prophet ﷺ. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want that? Now, we're imagining, we're imagining if we had this opportunity, the reality was that Sayyidina Awais al qanir al an was not imagined, was real. He was alive at the same time as the Prophet ﷺ. His love, his yearning to be a meet and greet the Prophet ﷺ was so overwhelming that he wanted to go. So if you go back on the slide, is that he had the dilemma here, is that on one side, love was saying, and dictating, go and visit Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Go and visit him. And the other side is that the being that you love, his order is look after your mother. She needs you. She's dependent upon you. So that's the dilemma that he was in. His heart, all his everything, his intellect, his mind is saying, go. Go. A heart is telling him, spirit is telling him, Ruth is telling him, go and visit. Because... You go, bless yourself, become a Sahabi. Imagine that uh, no matter how many Qutub and Ghos will come, they can never read the status of a Sahaba, a companion of the Prophet and They'll never read the status. All the Uliyas that come after the Sahaba, they can never reach the status of Sahaba. You now have the opportunity to have, one is a privilege to glance and have the sight of the Prophet, physically I see the Prophet Physically also be raised a darja of a sahaba, also be blessed, which uh, not just by the spirit, but also the zat of the Prophet and be blessed by that as well. And the other side is the hukum. The, the hukum of Rasulullah which is telling him, look after your mother. Because of the fact that Sayyidina Awais is that he understood he was a real lover. This is a lesson for me and you, is that he was a real lover of the Prophet Wasallam, and he manifests the highest form of love is that despite the fact his every faculty of his, his inner being was his, wanted to be with the Prophet Wasallam, he overruled. He overruled his feelings and his state. He overruled it and he said, no, I will actually look after my mother. This is not a light thing to do. This is not a, a easy thing to do. Is that he demonstrated the highest form of love? Is that the being that you love, which was Rasulullah, he loved the Prophet. And what he did was that love isn't that you get what you want. Love is that you want whatever the beloved wants. This is true love. Whatever the beloved wants, you love that and you want that. You want whatever the beloved wants. Is that here, he is demonstrating to me and you is that. I love, he's saying, I love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Me and you will say, we love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But what he is doing, he's saying is that, Ya Rasulullah, I want to be with you. I want to see you. I want to meet you. But I love you so much that you, whatever your hukum is, I will give preference to that. And I over, I over rule my feelings, whatever I want. And if you are happy with this, Ya Rasulullah Sallam, then I am happy. That is how he actually contended himself, and that is how he actually made peace with himself. So he gave preference over the command 
of the command of Rasulullah over his own feelings. And that is manifestation of the highest love. So me and you these days proclaim love. This is false love in one sense that, that me and you are claiming we love Rasulullah Yet still, we are not giving preference to the Sharia. We're not giving preference to the Sunnah. This is not love. This is showing preference towards dunya and nafsa and nafsanic nafs, and nafs towards feelings and nafs and shaitan. We're giving preference to that. When we go against the Sharia, when we go against the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, this is not love. Love is what the beloved wants. And if the beloved is saying, don't do this, you don't do it. And if the beloved said, do this, you do it. That is real love. That is real manifestation of love. So Sayyidina Awais al and he manifested the highest form of love uh, that uh, the Ummah has seen is that, that despite the fact that you have this one opportunity, imagine who would give that moment of being able to be in the presence of Prophet who would want to give? You would want to be anywhere near the Prophet but he gave that up so that he looks after his mother. So what was his state is that Sayyidina Awais al he passed his day and night serving his mother, pleasing Allah He used to pray Salah a lot, but there was a longing. Now here, remember you've read the Sirah, you read the Shema'il now, is that outwardly he is following the command of the Prophet and inwardly he was connected and longing and awareness and being and being absorbed in the remembrance of the Prophet that is the, this is the teaching that Sayyidina Awais is giving to me and you, is that outwardly follow the Sharia, outwardly follow the Sunnah, and inwardly be in the remembrance, be in the absorption, be in the light, and be in the muraqaba of Rasulullah Have that yearning, have that longing to be with him. So how he did is that despite looking after his mother, his inner was longing to be with the Prophet he wanted to be with the Prophet, but he kept on telling his nafs, he kept on telling his feelings, no, you can't go, you can't go, look after your mother, look after your mother. He kept on reminding himself of this. Even though his body, so the teaching Sayyidina Awais is, is giving us, giving to me and you, is that how we should be whilst we're in this time, is that, is that to benefit from the affairs. Remember we talked about facing towards the Prophet and the light of Prophet is that our his body was all the look his body was all the way in Yemen, but his inner, his mind, his heart, his faculties, inner faculties, everything was in the streets of Medina, roaming around the streets of Medina, wandering and venturing the streets of Medina, absorbing himself in the fragrance of Medina, and thinking and believing that he is there, that he with the Prophet. And that is what his, his 24 hours was like spending his time thinking if I can actually be, feel, I wonder what the person will be doing now. He'll be doing this. He'll be doing this. This is how he behaved. This is how he conducted himself. How much of ittaba he showed, listen to this, is that you've heard in the Battle of Uhud, that Sayyidina Awais al Karani. what happened was that in the Battle of Uhud, Rasulullah one of the blessed Tidka Shaheed, became Shaheed. So what happened is that when the news came, imagine a mother who loves a child and they hear that the child is, has a cut. How much does the mother feel that cut or injured himself or herself? The child has been hurt when the child falls. A father, a parent, when they see the baby child is actually ill, they can't tolerate it. When they see the child is actually hurt, they can't tolerate it. The child is crying, their hearts melt. A mother's hearts melt when they see their own child in pain and agony. When Sayyidina Awais heard that the process of blessed teeth became shaheed, this is called ittaba, this is called following. He grabbed a stone and this is called love. He grabbed a stone and he crushed one of the teeth out. But then guess what? You, me and you will be thinking, Alhamdulillah, now this is it yet. But look at the love. Love is saying is that I don't know which teeth of the Prophet it was, and I want to mimic him. He showed to the latter how to actually follow the Prophet. Look at this. Is that even though it's not demanding, Shiri is not demanding, but Mahabba, Mahabba love is overflowing. That he thought, my beloved has been hurt and injured. 
but I don't, and I, he, I want to share in that pain. What happened? Is it this teeth I actually it was Rashid? Maybe it's this one. So he got a, another stone and he hit the other teeth. Then he got and hit another one and, until all the teeth were broken. Love. That, oh, imagine we are so scared to smile without a teeth. Imagine he cracked all his teeth, not knowing. At least that way, now he shows that at least have got the, one of the teeth that Rosu actually was got into. Itteba, manifestation of love. So your body is here in Manchester, in London, in UK or Denmark or, or, or Pakistan or USA or Canada, wherever your body is there. But Sayyidina Oasis is saying, let your body be here. Let your inner faculties be with Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is what he's me, he is showing me in you. And that is what we're trying to do is develop that connection with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spiritually that our inner khayalas and thoughts or spirit can be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is the lesson he's giving us. I've mentioned that the, those people who claim love of the person, if they violate the Sharia, they really they are not showing love of the person, but they are actually showing love of their nafs and desires in shaitan and dunya. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi command was to serve his mother, so he, despite being difficult, he overruled his emotions. And that is what me and you have to do, is that there's a hukum of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi hukum of Sharia, for example, don't gaze. Despite the fact I love this woman, I love this man, I, I like this program, I like this food, I like it. If it's against the command of Allah, against the command of Rasulullah now you should overrule that feeling and stay away or do the thing that, uh, that the command is asking you to do. That is real love. That is real ittaba. That is real following. Now imagine that he's longing, he's spending his day and night longing to be with Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then one day, what happens? His blessed mother gives him permission to go. He said, she grants him permission to go. Now imagine how elated you've been waiting to go on a trip. You've been elated. You've been, for those brothers and sisters who, uh, those are, uh, uh, who are wanting to go to a holiday and uh, all of a sudden, and they're waiting for the COVID to go. Imagine how happy you'd be to go to Umrah, how happy you'd be to go to Hajj, how happy you'd be to go to Fez, Morocco, or Pakistan, or Bangladesh, or wherever you've been wanting to go. Maybe sometimes you're a place that you've never been before and you've been dying to go. How excited you'd be. Now imagine his heart was longing to be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then when his Blessed Mother gives him permission to go, she goes, I give him my permission to go, see him once, come straight back. As soon as you see the process, then come back straight away. If the mission is at home, you meet him, then if not, come straight back. Don't wait there. Don't hang around. Don't actually, what means you will do? We'll loiter around. Yes, we'll take a few days. No. She gave him clear instruction. Imagine clear instruction. Now go there. If you find the process and meet him, Alhamdulillah, greet him, then come back. If he's not there, then still come back. Don't wait around. Don't take too long. Come back to me. Why? It's because she needed him for the chores that need to be done. And this wasn't like we can catch a plane and there you go, we're in Medina Sharif within a five hours, six hours, whatever. This journey for him by four took three months to get to all the way to Medina Sharif. Three months by foot. Now imagine three months there, three months back. That's six months in a half a year. It's not an easy journey. But he went by foot and look at the other. Why? So then Oweis is saying that I am going to be uh, going to meet the greatest of the creation. I don't want to meet him as a person, not a mounted, a mounted animal or a beast or something. I will go humbly walking, my gaze is down, lowered, walking on the floor with respect and other, but meet the beloved messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That I am, I am nothing as it is. I want to meet Rasulullah Sallallahu as though I am nothing as well. Even though the Prophet Sallallahu already knew who this person is. Now, what happened is that he unfortunately, he did go. He did go to Medina Sharif. He did manage to actually get there. Once he arrived at Medina, at the Manawara, imagine with caution and with ease, with respect and other, with humility, entering the streets of Medina, 
absorbing imagine he's absorbing the fragrance the aroma that he's thinking this is where my beloved is to walk this is where us is to walk that this is the turn that you take prayed uh, salah upon uh, uh, in this uh, in the masjid nabawi he prayed salah there waiting there hoping that he might see the, uh, catch a uh, catch a glimpse of, of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam nobody was there at that time he waited he then went to the he asked and cried and he went to the blessed house of so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam knocked on the door hazrat aisha siddiqa radhiyallahu an opened the door he inquired i am uh, such as such is that can you please tell me is the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam rasul allah sallam, is, is he home imagine all his life he's been dreaming to meet the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam thinking that he will not get the opportunity but luckily allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam put in the mother's heart to allow him to go now he's not got much time he's been told to hurry so he quickly knocks and he's now trying to make sure that if he can just just maybe the person wasn't in the mosque maybe he's inside the house maybe i get to see the blessed prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam inside the blessed hujra mubarak the knock said aisha siddiq radhiyallahu anha she opens the door she then gives him the news that unfortunately the messenger of allah has gone out to the town has gone out to the city and she doesn't know when he'll be back imagine you're told this news as you go and knock you've been waiting not knowing whether you're going to get another opportunity again not knowing that you know this is the one time one moment that you can actually be here to catch the glimpse of the greatest of creation your beloved that one time the heart and mind can be put at ease by seeing the beloved of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that you knock and you're hoping that they're home and then you are told the news they are not home and they do, you do not know when they'll be back and what was the mother's instruction the mother said is if you don't meet him then come straight back don't waste time this was playing on his mind and his head again and again and again as soon as she to hazrat aisha siddiq radhiyallahu anha said this he immediately stepped back towards yemen because of what has been played he just said if you can just kindly just give the news that i give my salam to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and and he then saw permission and he went when the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam imagine they knew the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam knew um <clears throat> the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam knew that uh, that the way sir the lan actually came and visited she uh, he when he came in he regular hadat mubarak would in general inquire if anything if anybody has come as it ashes dika had obviously maybe forgotten or whatever we don't know but rasul sam did anyone come to uh, come to visit the house while sir way she remembered yes there was a a person who a, a camel herder who came to visit it seems as though he had coarse clothes and he seemed as though he had come from a distant land it was a camel herder came to see you but i said that you are not at home imagine when rasul sam had this as soon as he heard this he gives us a salam as soon as rasul sam heard this his face lit up with a smile that what my that was my awareness she said to us that she said the great alan that he said is that oh i said that was my always who came to visit so when he went back all the way to yemen uh, and he went back with the imagine you you know that was your one moment that was your one chance to see to catch glimpse of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and you know not knowing if you'll have another chance again and imagine that is uh the opportunity that you had and it's gone now not knowing if you have another chance again how much of a heavy heart is you going back towards yeah man and back towards his home towards his mother how much of a heavy heart would it be for him to go back but still again hukum of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that despite his feeling despite the fact that with a heavy heart he's walking back because he gave preference to the command of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so he went back he went back to yemen and then he carried on doing what he did before serving his mother tending to her needs 
and so on. Until what happened? One day, Aziz is actually doing his chores. Then uh, one of the days he heard the news. Now imagine how he rather than is feeling that the messenger of Allah has departed and left this temporal world. The news came. For those of you who have lost someone, someone like your mother, your father, or your brother, your sister, or your wife or your child, you know when that per the day of, in which you somebody who you loved so much passes away or you get broken, that's it, you're not going to see them again forever and ever, you're not going to see them again. How would that feeling be? How would it be? But imagine the news came that he had the opportunity to go at that time and he did, but Allah SWT did not will for him to see the Prophet Then the news came that the Prophet has left this temporal world. He fell ill. He couldn't bear his day. He couldn't bear his night. He had to lie down for three days. He lied down and fell sick, thinking that, that my beloved has left and left us. For him, it wasn't worth living anymore. Like the Sahaba and I felt as well, who was such ashikin, is that for them, it felt as though that it's not worth living. They'd rather be slain. But what is the point of living when they, when they have such a being which is in front of them, that being then goes, how can they possibly live? But again, the Sahabu were true lovers, just like Hazrat al An was a true lover, is that despite Rusul and leaving this temporal world, they followed and made sure that they actually carried out the hukum of Rasulullah and his mission. So he fell sick, could have moved bed bound, fell sick, fell ill. And this is what love does, is that those uh, people who love, uh, the, when the beloved it goes away, they cannot move, they cannot tolerate not being able to see the beloved. And this is how they are, they're sick due to love and separation. So here is a look, is a Sayyidina Wais al Karani, he opened the door for this whole of the Ummah. How has he opened the door? Is that he is showing me and you is that physically, me and you cannot be with the Prophet. Physically. We've we we have not had the opportunity to meet them physically. But Sayyidina Wais al Karani is also showing, look, I didn't meet uh, the Rasul just just look at my life, look at my love, look at my obedience to the Prophet and still I am blessing, being blessed by the Prophet I'm being blessed. Such a blessing, it, 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 he has been enlightened, such a basira that he had, that we, once when Hazrat Ali and, and Hazrat Umar and asked when they met Sayyidina Awais, which we'll come to in a bit, is that when they met Sayyidina Awais al Qarni they asked, can you describe us the Prophet to us? Because they already knew the status of Sayyidina Awais. They said, oh, oh, oh Awais, can you describe us to us the Prophet He had such an insight, such a bashira, such a kashf that Allah spiritually, yes, physically he couldn't be with the Prophet, but spiritually he was always with Prophet. And he described the Prophet in such detail that even the Sahaba didn't know, even these two blessed companions didn't know the detail of such, that he was there. So with the, some of the features, some of the marks that they, even they went aware, they were astonished how clear his vision of the Prophet was and how detailed he described the Prophet. So he opened the gates for me and you, showing us that until the day of judgment, those people who will truly love and who will truly follow the Prophet ﷺ will never be deprived and will always receive his fares and blessing. If you really truly love the Prophet ﷺ and attach yourself to him and you really follow his hukum, his lifestyle, his ways, he is demonstrating, he's showing us that the doors of fares of Rasulullah will open up to you. The doors of the affairs of Prophet will open up to you. You don't need to worry about anything. The praise in which the Prophet gave to Sayyidina Awais is that he used to say, on some of the saying of the Prophet, this is paraphrasing that word in the Prophet but from the side of Yemen, I can smell the fragrance of Rahman, the breeze of Klosal al 
this is how they describe Sayyidina Abu Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imagine one side in Medina, you have his beloved, which is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the other side in Yemen, you have whom? Sayyidina Abu Imagine, if the, let's say for example, for you brothers and sisters, maybe for brothers, they have a football star or a movie star. And you come to here, maybe on Facebook these days, they say, oh Bashir, well done. I, I miss you so much and I hope you're well. How ecstatic would you be that you love that person so much, you want to follow them, they mention your name. How ecstatic would you be? You'd be overjoyed, overjoyed. But here, look at this, is that say, you, the people that we give our love to, the, uh, the, the famous movie stars, the pop stars, the singers, the football stars, the politician, none of them probably know us by name. Yes, they will give such allegiance to them, we just give such following to them. None of them by, know us by their name. But yet, so they would give such allegiance, but what happens is that they never remember you either. Here, the, the love of Allah and is such that if you remember them, they will remember you. If you love them, they replicate that love back. That Sayyidina Awais is absorbed in the remembrance and love of Rasulullah in Yemen, and Rasulullah can see this, and that's why he mentioned to the Sahaba, look, there is such a being, there's a, such a personality in Sayyidina Awais, his name is Awais, that if he asks, and the Sahaba astonished, how is it, who is this person? They're saying that he's such a servant of Allah, I'm just paraphrasing my word, he's such a servant of Allah, that if he, whatever he wanted, whatever he wants from Allah, if he was to I say, uh, by Allah, this will happen, yeah, Allah will make it happen. If he was to actually want something to happen, Allah will make it happen. If he wanted, uh, if he asked for forgiveness or something, Allah will forgive and then he went to say that there is a tribe, there's a tribe in the time of the Prophet which had the highest number of herds of sheep and, and goats. And what happened is that Rasulullah is that my aware, Sayyidina Awais is that he will benefit the Ummah that through his dua, by the number of, uh, number of hairs and every single of this herd of this, uh, this, this cattle, uh, this, this uh, the sheep, number of sheep and number of uh, goats, by uh, by this tribe which had the number of the herds of sheep and goats by the dua of Sayyidina Awais by him by the Wasila Sayyidina Awais by the number of heads of a, on every single one of those uh, sheep and, and, and goats is that my ummati will actually be saved from the hellfire through the dua of Sayyidina Awais that is the status that he had and that is whom Rasulullah said mentioned to the Sahaba Say, uh, Rasulullah said then called Sayyidina Umar and Sayyidina Ali. In one narration, he said to Sayyidina Umar, oh, Umar, there is such a personality by the name of Awais. You find him, he's, in a, uh, he's from the uh, a chrome of tribe of Murad in a village of, of in Yemen, in a village called Karan. You will find him there. And if you can, if chance has it that if you're able to, then go to him and you ask for his forgiveness for you and ask him to make forgiveness for my ummah. On the other occasion, he knew because the Rasulullah knew that there's no point of me turning to Abu Bakr because he already knew that Abu Bakr would not be around at that time. So then Rasulullah said, is that, said is that here I have a cloak. Imagine the Rasulullah gets, bless it, he went out, gets, gets his cloak off, and the Rasulullah didn't have that much clothing anyway. He gets blessed cloak Mubarak out and he presents it to Sayyidina Umar Sayyidina Ali is that here is my cloak. Now the Sahaba are thinking this is maybe for one of us. Imagine Rasulullah has got the cloak out. He can't be, this is maybe for one of us. They think it may be for us, one of us. Knowing that Rasulullah would not be able to see uh, Sayyidina Awais and knowing that he made effort to come but unfortunately Allah SWT didn't will it is that he gave the cloak Mubarak to Sayyidina Umar and said, O oh Umar, O oh Ali, is that I give you this as an amana that after my death, after my departure from this world, go and find and give this to Uwais. Give this to him, pass it on to him, and ask Uwais to make dua for my ummah. Ask Uwais to make dua for my ummah. And then he explained about the, the vast amount of people that will be forgiven by the dua of Sayyidina Uwais. 
the Sahaba in amazement and Sayyidina Umar and Sayyidina Ali were in amazement that such a person in the Ummah lives the Prophet is actually doing the tarif of that we don't even, we, none of us have even heard of, but he's mentioning us to us. So what happened is that Sayyidina Umar took on this amana uh, and what he did was that he then waited, the some Mujahideen were going to come from Yemen, uh, from Yemen to help out the Muslimin. And what happens is that he waited for, and his eyes was trying to catch a glimpse if he, uh, he, uh, if he can catch Sayyidina Awais amongst the, amongst the tribes, amongst the people, amongst the army. But unfortunately, he didn't, the, his Basir was such that he wasn't able to spot Sayyidina Awais. He asked the people, do you know anybody of, uh, by the name of Awais? He's from such an area. They said, no, we don't know. Him. Because why? He led a life in which he didn't want to be known by people. Me and you want to be known, but he had a life in which he didn't want to be known. He hid from people. People used to mock him. They used to ridicule him. But he hid from them. So what happened was that Sayyidina, Uwais, uh, Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Umar al -An, one day then they decide, okay, we will go to Yemen. Fulfilled uh, the Hukum of Rasulullah As they, as they travel, uh, travel to all the way to Yemen, they went around Imagine, you know, who, who is going? Imagine who is going. You, when one personality is such after Sayyidina Abu Siddi, he is the highest ranking person on the face of the earth. And then the other is the king of Ali Allah. The Bab al-Ilm of Medina and the access to Rasulullah is Sayyidina Ali Radha Two of the greatest, two of the greatest personalities in the whole of the Ummah. They are coming. People flock, people run. They want to catch a glimpse to see Sayyidina Umar, Sayyidina Ali Tala'an. They flock because they know that if we see this blessed person, maybe we get intercession and we get forgiveness from Allah SWT. And also they become a tabi'i. Not a sahaba, but they become a tabi'i. A person who sees one of the sahaba, companions of Prophet and uh, dies in that state of Iman, he becomes a tabi'i. So they had the chance to become a tabi. People are flocking to see. So when they went to Yemen, they were hoping that we can see, we people, maybe Awais also comes. So then Awais also comes and he also visits us and then we can actually hand this amana that Rasul Sancho gave us. But they were looking, he was not coming. They were asking people, oh, do you know who's Awais? Do you know Awais from this tribe, this area? No, they don't know, nobody said. Eventually, what happened? Eventually, the people saying, wait, we know someone. We don't know him by name. We know somebody. But uh, are you sure he, this is the person? They said, yeah, he's such and such. They tried to describe him. They say, we know somebody, but he's like a madman. He's in that area, in that village of Karen. He's in that area. But he's a madman. Everybody ridicules him, laughs at him. Imagine who they're talking about. The real Awliya Allah and Salihim, people will mock. People don't give value. They really don't actually know the status. If the people knew the status that they're aware, they would not be doing what they're doing. They would not be mocking him. Rather, they'll be actually gifting him, praising him, and kissing his feet. But what happened? Look, they say he's a madman. So Sayyidina Ali Allah and Salihim said, why? why do you say he's a madman? He said, the strangest thing they said the strangest thing is that he walks, he comes out of his house and he goes and he walks in the streets wandering like a lost child looking for something. Goes on the other side, he looks for something. Goes on the other street, he looks for something. And he spends his day just going from one edge to another, to another street, to another street. And then he goes back home again. And he does the same thing again. <laughs> like a madman, lost, like... A mother has lost, a child has been lost from the mother, has been separated, looking for the mother, looking for the mother. That's how it is. And we find that crazy. Sayyidina Ali Radha Al-An with the smile, he said, he is not a madman. He is not a madman. Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Umar replied to him is that he is looking for the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He 
he is hoping that he can actually see Rasulullah Islam, maybe on the street, maybe him. Then maybe he catches a glimpse of the Prophet and despite knowing that he's gone, and that he couldn't see them, maybe he can catch a glance, maybe he appears. So he goes from one street, then he goes to another, hoping to see the Prophet ﷺ. They said another strange thing that he does, just watches it, is that we see that when people in the area in the village, they smile and laugh, he cries. He cries. And when they cry, he laughs. They said, the reason why this is, is that when he sees them laughing and joking and enjoying themselves, he sees that they're in, these people have been deluded by the dunya and that they're not, they've forgotten the akhirah and they've forgotten the real abode which is waiting for them and that, that they're not working for that. And when they see them crying and weeping and he laughs, is that he sees that they are crying and weeping over temporal things. This dunya is on temporal and these are like toys that a child loses when they lose something. That a child loses a toy, a broken dad, they cry over that. And he sees pity in them that this is such a childish thing that they are crying over. So he smiles and he laughs. So they said, tell us where can we find you anyway tell us who this madman is tell us where you can find you they said he's around this area in this village you'll find him there so they went as imagine this is the two great personalities of islam going towards the beloved house the area in which the village of karam in which said where is actually residing they see a strange thing they see that the children are throwing pebbles. The children are throwing pebbles at this strange person. They couldn't wonder. When they see and said, they could see that when they see this person, they, then said, they realize this could be said, they see said, saying to the children, oh, children, imagine the children, because they find it funny, he had leprosy, he's maybe slightly disfigured, he is of dark skin, obviously. They think this is a person with sh shaggy clothing, patches all over the place. They think this is like a person with no value, no significance whatsoever. Let's just have fun with him. So what they used to do, they'd mock him, they'd rid ridicule him, and they'd throw stones at him. Throw stones. He stopped the children, said, he said, oh children, I don't mind you throwing stones, but throw smaller stones. Yes, you can throw, but just throw smaller stones so that at least then I can keep my wuzu intact. So that it doesn't bleed so much that at least my wuzu will be intact. So the bleeding, they can see is gushing in blood. What? Of what? From the pebbles of stone of thrown by the children. When they saw Sayyidina uh, Umar and Sayyidina Ali, they quickly ran off. They came off the horse, they greeted Sayyidina Awai Sayyidina Ali. They said, we've been, we're looking for a Wes. Are you such a person? He said, yes, I am a Wes. This is who I am. He said, uh, by Allah, we've been looking for you for this for quite a while. He goes, please just, uh, I cannot attend to you now. I have been out of my house for quite a while and my mother is waiting for me. Please uh, let me first attend to my mother and then actually uh, we'll actually uh, attend to your need in, in a bit, inshallah. He then went home, he went home, looked after his mother, uh, tend to her chores, fulfilled her needs. And then he made sure that Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Umar are waiting. Once he attended to his mother, once this was done, he then came back out again. He came back out uh, to these blessed companions. He said, yes, how can I help? Sayyidina Umar and said, we're looking for a West because we have been given a mana to hand to you uh, by the Prophet and they mentioned you to give this to you. 
imagine me and you would be excited, but the humbleness of Sayyidina Awais was such, he said, the Prophet gave this, no, it's probably another Awais that he's talking about, not me. It's probably another Awais that uh, the Rasul is talking about, it's not me. Uh, it's not me, it's somebody else. Uh, this is definitely not for me. Why would Rasul give something to me? They said, no, 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 they said to give it to you. We know it is you. He looked at the Nishani that Rasul said, okay, you'll see some leprosy on uh, uh, remaining on his hand or on his shoulder. They said, look, we, let me see your hand. We saw the, the, the marks which is still there of leprosy. They said, this is definitely you because the Rasul told totally look for you. He started to weep, said the note where he started to weep. Then they said, this is the cloak, the blessed cloak the Prophet gave to us. We were here to give this to you. And Rasulullah said is that this is for you. And also they said, OS is that you should make dua for uh, the forgiveness of the Ummah. He grabbed the cloak. He grabbed the cloak and he went. He went to the, in the, to the side of the room outside and started to pray and started to weep on the cloak and started to weep and weep and weep and cry. Such was the crying and such was the dua for such a long time he was crying and weeping that Hazrat Umar and Hazrat Ali Radalan, they both had pity for him, of mercy, had mercy on him. They went on him and they said, oh, where's come now, come back, that's enough, that is enough. He said, don't stop, why have you stopped me? They came back and said, come spend time with us. Imagine they're trying to benefit or say that we would be chuffed that they, that they say that Ali, say that Umar, say that Umar, say that Umar, want to spend time with say that Umar, but say that Umar is busy in the mission, the hukum that Rasulullah gave him. What was he doing? Is that the last farman, the last instruction was for him was make dua for my forgiveness of my ummah. He is crying and weeping for forgiveness of my said, is that Sayyidina Awais said is that had you not stopped me, I would have carried on making dua, I would have carried on making dua for forgiveness of the ummah until my dying breath, or until actually all the ummah is being forgiven. I would not have stopped. Because this was the instruction of Rasulullah and I would not have stopped until either I die or the whole of the Ummah was forgiven. Moved by tears by Sayyidina Awais, Sayyidina Umar Radha and Sayyidina Ali said, come and spend some time with us, tell us something. So that they thought they can benefit and vice versa. Sayyidina Awais said, oh Umar, oh Ali, we don't have much time. Another time maybe we can spend, and the time for us to meet is, will be in Jannah. That's when we can spend our time. But now we don't have much time. We should depart. We have a mission that is uh, on our, up on our shoulders, uh, given by Prophet Sallallahu We should carry on that mission and fulfill it. And after a short while, then they departed and left. They say that Sayyidina Awai Sallallahu Alaihi seldom people actually really saw Sayyidina Awai Sallallahu Alaihi because he kept himself hidden, unknown from people. He'd go from one town to another. People would not know him, stay there for a few days and then move on to the next town. Stay for a few days and move on to the next town. Eventually, like I said to you, is that he went, I went at the Battle of Sifin, he fought in the side of Sayyidina Ali Tala and, and he was martyred there uh, in the Battle of Sifin in Syria area and he's buried in Raqqa in Syria. So this was the, to, uh, Nearest effect, the story of Sayyidina Awais of the and, and the love and obedience that he manifested and showed towards Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the, the shafaqa compassion he showed towards others and the Ummah of the Prophet. The lesson that me and you can take from the blessed life of Sayyidina Awais is obviously of love. You can see how much love he, he showed and manifested, true love, not fake love like myself and me uh, would show an acclaim. But the lesson we can to attain closeness to the Prophet to attain, have attachment to the Prophet you must give preference. You must give preference to the Sharia and the Sunnah of the Prophet 
And that is how why we went through the Sira, so you can understand the importance of the Sira, that our outer bodies need to be full and conforming to the Sira Mubarak of the Prophet. His Sunnah, his Sharia, his way. This is how he showed and demonstrated that such importance of Sharia is that whatever your desire is, whatever your will and what your want is, sacrifice that, overrule that, and be obedient to the Sharia and the Sunnah. Second thing that he demonstrated or he taught us is that to be attached to the Prophet through body and mind, heart and spirit, to be outwardly decorated in the Sunnah, following his akhlaq, following his ways. Remember what we discussed before, not harming the creation, not but rather benefiting them. And then what we said is that whatever negativity others do or act or comment, you reply with goodness. This is what Sayyidina Awais did. Is that, first of all, is that about the intoxication is that his body, mind, heart and spirit was intoxicated in love and the remembrance and the presence of Prophet Sallallahu His body was in Yemen, but all his other faculties were in the streets of Medina with the Prophet Sallallahu Then giving, gave preference to the mission of the Prophet Sallallahu trying to save the Ummah from destruction and harm by making dua for them. They, people, children, threw stone at him. What did he do? He made uh, threw duas at them of forgiveness, of maghfirah, of hadaya. He tolerated the Ummah's torture upon him, misgivings upon him. He tolerated all that. Why? Because he understood the reality of this dunya. He understood the, the reality of this dunya and the afterlife and the reality of akhirah, that this dunya is temporal. We're not here for this place. We're here for akhirah. He manifested the highest level of humbleness despite being so high-ranking spiritually. Spiritually, he was a sahib of fat. He was in the vision of the Prophet He was older in the vision of the Prophet as confirmed by Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Umar. That they both confirmed about his vision, his basira. So spiritually, he was already benefiting. Spiritually, he was already interacting. Spiritually, he was already conversing. He's opened the door for me and you that you don't need to physically meet the Prophet ﷺ physically to spiritually interact with him. This is the door that he's opened for me and you. That he has opened that door for me and you that physically you cannot meet. Don't worry. Spiritually, his fears is still there. Spiritually, you can connect. Spiritually, you can be in the gathering with the Prophet. Spiritually, you can converse with him. Spiritually, you can shake uh, hands with them, kiss his blessed feet, kiss his blessed uh, hands, Mubarakah. Sp- uh, bless uh, the blessed sp- fragrance you can smell and spiritually. Spiritually, you can see them, glance at them, be with them. Not for one minute, not for one hour, for 24 hours for the rest of your life. If you want to be like that, you can't be like that because. He rather than demonstrated to us that that is how he was like. That is how me and you can be. And hence why he was the door, open the door of mercy and open the doors to the affairs of Rasulullah for me and you, for the whole of the ummah, that me and you can relate that not seeing and being with the Prophet physically isn't the end of the world, rather following the Sharia, following his sunnah and then attaching yourself the whole retreat is about attachment to the Prophet. if you attach yourself spiritually and find yourself that being who can open that unlock that door for you i.e through the blessed teacher shah Dabal, that through them they open that door to you that spiritually that door opens up for me and you to be in the presence of prophet alone and then Open your heart to, to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi however you want to open your heart and converse with them, interact with them, be in the sight of them, be in love with them, be in following them inwardly and outwardly. That is what he rather than demonstrated to me and you for all his life. And that is why he is the summation of the Sharia of Muhammadiyah and the Hakikat of Muhammadiyah. Is that he is the summarization, the manifestation, the model for me and you, that me and you physically cannot meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi fine, khair. But he has demonstrated to me and you that we can be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi spiritually and there's no limits to that.
it can still, you can, you, why not? You are the Ummah of Prophet as he was. He's saying, you are also the Ummah of Prophet Why can't you? Why can you not meet? Why cannot you be with the Prophet You have every right. So he opened the doors for me and you, for the, to the affairs. Look, one was that he had the interaction, but also the gifts that was given, the blessed cloak Mubarak that was given. So much spiritual gifts the Prophet is giving and wanted to give more and more but me and you are deprived. So why? Because like we saw, there's the son of Rasulullah, the Muhammadan light, the Muhammadan rays, which is face, which we should be facing. But me and you are facing the other way, and we're in darkness. So my dear brothers and sisters, learn from Sayyidina Awais al and that face yourself, face and turn your mind, turn your heart, turn your bodies, Turn your spirit towards Rasulullah and the Muhammadan light and absor be absorbed in his love, be absorbed in his remembrance, be absorbed in the light of the Sunnah of the Prophet and be a shining star for others, be a source of mercy for others like he was so that you can carry out the mission of the Prophet and be with him in this life despite physical not being, but you can be with the Prophet spiritually in this life and then, alhamdulillah, when the door of Akhir opens up for you, you're with him forever and ever and ever, inshallah, bi'iznillah. Subhanaka no bihamdik, ashadu Allah, ilan tastaghfir atub, ilan jazak, ilan sana jazak. Now, if you have any short questions, we can actually answer that if you can. Otherwise, inshallah, aziz, um, uh, hopefully now uh, we'll have a break. Uh, we'll have a, now, hopefully you can have a, a long break, should we say, rest. And the next uh, session, with, uh, I'll, I'll pass it on to uh, the Umair, who will tell you what the time slot for the next session is. Inshallah. Okay, so Jazakallah, Hassan, Jazak. Allah, so forgive me for anything wrong that I've said, any mistake that I made, all false wrongs for myself, all evil for myself, and whatever goodness I've said about the Barak and the blessing of the Mashaikh, blessed teacher, Shaykh Mutabar, and also uh, the Barak and blessing of Rasulullah and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is all from them, not from myself. Jazakallah Hassan, Jazakallah Subhanakallah, Bihamdik, Ashhadu Allah and Astaghfiru Tuba Ilaik. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakallah khair to Ustad Imam Gais for such a thought-provoking nasiya on Jadina Oas Al Qurni radiyallahu anhu. So now, uh, as they have mentioned, that we're going to have a long break, and this break is going to, inshallah, yeah, last up until 2.30 a.m. So now uh, we've uh, had to make a slight tweak to the schedule so we can incorporate, uh, inshallah, uh, a lot more and have that user um, experience uh, be a lot better, inshallah. So the, plan of, uh, so the plan of action will be that from now up until 2.30, that you take... Uh, um, uh, they take rest and we do want you to actually uh, they, they take that rest and have some sleep because the main uh, uh, actually a main year presentation yeah, will be uh, the uh, uh, that will be led by Ustad Abdul Rahim the Bagh uh, and that will be uh, the Muraqba Muhammadiyah so the pinnacle of the full year retreat inshallah will be in the morning and Ustad Abdul Rahim the Bagh will go through that so as a rough sort of your plan if you can if you can sort of uh, you wake up for two o'clock, you refresh yourself and uh, be here for 2.30 uh, uh, prompt because we're going to be starting then inshallah. So we're going to be starting at 2.30 prompt uh, and inshallah uh, the sisters will, will update in the sisters uh, uh, WhatsApp group uh, and then uh, the admin team will also update the brothers. So from now up until 2.30 will be uh, a short rest and or even a long rest, uh, yeah, shall I say, and then yeah, from there onwards, we're going to have the Muraqba Muhammadiyah presentation and practical. And also, as the feedback has uh, has um, they come through, uh, we want to obviously, first of all, yeah, thank you for that. And the second of all, we've also uh, done an extended time for the feedback. So we've listened to the feedback and we've implemented it into the schedule. And that will also be... Uh, after uh, after the actually so we're gonna inshallah yeah, try to extend that and have a forty five minute yeah, session just for feedback as yeah, as you have yeah, requested and inshallah we have listened to that so uh, so I'm just gonna yeah, mention a few your yeah, feedback now from uh, uh, Ustad Imam uh, your guesses yeah, beyond and the first one I want to do is this one it says Subhanallah I have been to so many beyonds in ten years. 
The story of Sayyidina Awais al-Qurni, subhanAllah azawajal, I can't say in words, it melted my heart. When they cried, uh, when they're making dua, you're yeah, with the cloak, subhanAllah, you know, uh, 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 with the cloak Mubarak on, I cried, I'm speechless. How have I been gifted uh, uh, this retreat? Me a huge yes sinner, and no parents, no spouse, just my love for Rasul, Abak, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and my love for Allah Azawajal. Um, but uh, I carry in my heart, but I've done so much you're wrong. Uh, how has uh, how has Allah Azawajal yeah, gifted me this blessing, shukr, and all the was, uh, all the brothers and sisters uh, in the uh, in the gathering, and for the Ustads, Salam. Just goes to show how much of a profound impact this is having on the participants and everyone else here listening here. SubhanAllah, mashallah, that was a very powerful nasiha, jazakallah khair. We also have, um, yeah, one, your yeah, sister mentioned, it made me cry. Uh, as well, we have, uh, so now, uh, I mean, I just wanted to sort of, yeah, go, yeah, fr um, uh, yeah through that. So, uh, if we say we're going to start on the dot for 2.30 in the morning, so if you can obviously yeah, wake up, you refresh yourself, um, yeah, do wuzu if you need to do wuzu, and make sure you're ready and attentive for 2.30 a.m. Jazakallah khair wa asana jazah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.